Well, welcome everyone. Today we have David Lee. David is a biokineticist and strength coach. He originally comes from South Africa, where he completed his primary and tertiary schooling. He attended Cal State University, Long Beach, and completed his master's in science and kinesiology with a specialization in sports medicine and injury studies. He holds several certifications related to strength training, sports, sports performance, movement assessment, and corrective exercise. David currently works at a training facility in Long Beach and Orange, along with running a learn to swim business with his wife. Previously, he lived in Australia and was involved in running a research project investigating localized patellar tendon strain me me uh, mechanics. The findings of the project were published in a peer-reviewed journal and presented at various local and international conferences. David's here going to speak with us about um, physical activity and really putting together a lot of the different elements that we have learned in this class. All right, without further ado, here's David. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an opportunity to uh, to here this morning. Um, just as we go forward, um, if any questions at any point as we go through, please uh, ask. I do ask uh, this is a kind of an amalgamation as well as a um, a com combination of everything we've done in the last couple of lectures. Please think back to the questions that were asked regarding health and fitness in the last couple of lectures. So what I'm trying to do in this lecture is from a health professional point of view, you were working with you were working with someone who wants to put your own health fitness program together. What do you need to do? What information do you need to be getting? What's the pipeline that you to to actually then put yourself or someone you know in the situation to improve your health wellness and fitness? So what I've done is broken down all the steps that you've actually included that and covered in the class, but now I'm putting in the pipeline so imagine a reverse funnel. We have got all this information, we have all these goals, how do you put that together to get the best out of the time and the effort that you to get your health and fitness? Um, to start, it's no as a puzzle, health fitness is exactly the same. Uh, fitness nutrition, what's the best program? It's the program that works. Highly unique, it's very individualistic. I can give all of you the same variables to come up with 10 months. The key to being successful is to figure out what works and what particular order for you as a person that you're actually working. So how I would like to present this is uh, it's a gold service through by Simon Sinek. Has anyone, anyone ever heard of it? They've actually got a very good TED talk on uh, Star with Why. And what this is more of a model explaining the motivation between making decisions and outcomes. So um, why, how, and what? So the why is kind of the intrinsic motivation. So what he says is you have the brain, you have your gut feel, you think, you speak, and your emotions, and all of them are independent. So if you get a situation, if you've got feel just feels right, that would be your why. It's intrinsic motivation. And why that is important is to think in terms of health and fitness. Do you enjoy training? Do you enjoy exercise? Probably some of you that will, but the majority of people don't. So unless you get down to the base motivation, the really intrinsic drive, the chances are most people will not continue to be successful in terms of the health and fitness channel. Looking at, we've just gone into the new year, for example. Um, everyone had the solution, but I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to show you the specific goal. Does anyone know how many people have to be beyond the first ever? That's 10. Any guesses? Pretty much that bad. That's 10%. So 90% of the people that have a resolution to lose weight are going to be up by the first ever. And that's what they don't understand processes and motivation together. So what I'm looking for at the first of lecture is why is the motivation, what do you need to delve down to to actually get those information, get that information that allows you to design a program to get to what you want to get to. And the how and the what, the how is just the information, it's all the variables that you can actually cover the class. And then we have the what, which is the actual doing. And that will give any of you the knowledge you may use that's more the key is all achieved, and we'll cover that as we go through. What I've kind of done to the training process is very much a business model, but it holds true with uh, health and fitness. And as you said, it's a process, it's a circle, it's a continual ongoing analysis, intervention, re analysis. You need to know what you want to do. So when you go to gym, 
or your baby health is doing it, I want to get to what is what does that look like? To you? I want to get to Scott. How, how do we do that? So the idea on this pathway or the cycle is that the endpoint goals come up with a plan, implement that plan, plan in action, and then reassess at the end. So the behavioral change model, I think that's because in class, there are pre-contemplation, contemplation, but in actual maintenance. That's kind of what your cycle is in terms of health needs. So kind of what we're looking at, the why, the starting point to get motivation. Most of these you see have covered in class. We're going to look at the exercise pre-screening, just the general your lifestyle background, your stress, sleep, and nutrition. So those are covered in class recently. I'm going to probably add to that. Again, if you have any questions that you go through from what you have in class, please let me know. Uh, your lifting age. So what that is primarily is if you've been lifting, if you are exercising, are you a beginner novice? Are you a beginner novice expert? Uh, something I find working with people a lot of time after the lifting age, I think of any lifting experience. The experience takes you to take what you've done in the past, it doesn't take into account what you're actually currently doing. The example that would be if, if you've been lifting for two or three years, it'll be advanced. But if you take two or four years off, three or four months off, you basically go back to being advanced. And the reason being is all training, with your tissue adapts to different rates. You have a neural system tendon, muscle, bone. They all need certain time frames to adapt. So in a training program, you want to consider what you're currently doing, not what you've done in the past. Then we've got uh, goal setting. Uh, they'll kind of go into why you're actually there, what are the time frames you're looking at, and then also your sense assessment, your medical health and fitness, which have been covered over the past previously. Um, look at your screening. Um, again, depending on what population you're working with, like yourself, Feel younger or fitter, this is probably less important. But as you get older or work with people that are of older age, this will get more important. Reason being is not everyone is in peak health. There are certain medical conditions that do affect what programming you do, what exercise you do, what requirements. And those requirements can be in terms of the settings. If someone has a uh, cardiac issue in China, they're not going to be trained in the normal gym. Or probably more than corrective rehab facility where there's medical uh, expertise in the life. Um, other things to consider um, in the population is you notice most chronic diseases happen later. You need to be aware of what the habits are as well as the training of that. So when you get to start to work with someone, just to sit down, has anyone worked with a trainer? Into the gym, that assessment. Yeah. So, what's generally the first thing they have you do? They sit down, get the damage informed, ask you a bunch of questions. What's the purpose of that? Try to gauge where you're at. Exactly, gauge where you're at with, with this profile. So, in terms of those profiles, yes, you get a damage informed, you accept the risk, but also you've got no idea what your family background is, what your fitness background is, so forth. So when you fill in that form, you categorize it's uh, pretty much low, medium, and high risk. And what that's basically saying is what exercise you say to do, what exercise or what exercise is health indications you have. For someone that's low risk, or for someone that's very young, no health factors, no family issues. Conversely, a high risk would be someone uh, or an older male, uh, high blood pressure, inactive, overweight. Family history. So it's tick box, tick box, tick box. So you become a high risk. For someone that's not in a health professional setting, that's someone you'd say, hey, look, you probably need to go to the doctor. There was last time you had to go blood, the blood work drawn just to get pre screened to make sure it's uh, safe to train. Um, an example of that would be someone that had a cardiac issue. If you have them do exercise overhead, you're going to put up the heart rate blood pressure. What's going to happen if they have a cardiac issue? The risk is way, way high for these. So you pretty much have that flow as you go through where in terms of the risk, the recommendations, pre-screening and exercise. Yeah, so big one, going into the life self background, it's the stress which comes from what I like to do is take you through what's termed the journal adaptation syndrome. Uh, this is a theory from Dr. Sale back in the 1950s, where all a organism 
living organism that is placed under stress responds in a certain mode way. And that's what the hero adaptation syndrome is. So you're looking at the time frame, this is anywhere between one and 12 weeks only. Um, you have stress resistance basically on Y basis on the X. And what that's doing is when an organism is placed in a situation of stress, you have a long phase initially. What that does is the body is not used to that stress, literally panics, hence the name along. It's your stress, you're tired, your body that way. So if you've done exercise previously, think when you started training very well. When you're the most sore, when you're the most stiff, the first couple of weeks. So that is your, your uh, alarm phase. Now, if you continue with that same stress, it gives the body the opportunity to actually adapt and improve. So that's when you move into the resistance phase. What you're doing there is the body saying, okay, the stress is more continuous, it's more of a daily task. I'm going to adapt to that, I'm going to get better, I'm going to improve. However, if you continue with that same stressor, because of the increased efficiency, the body actually fatigues, which means it has and does not respond in the same way. So the easy way would be if you keep doing the same walk. What do you notice? If I keep doing that same walk, it's easier and a bit faster, but you tend to plateau. So it gets easier to do the same amount of work. Um, an easy way to explain that would be if you go to the gym, you start a lifting program, um, you move up your watches, track the calories, and then your calories burn. You'll probably say three, four hundred calories initially. A month later, the watch is still saying three, four hundred calories, but your body's probably burning less than half that. Why? They've got more efficient, there's less stimulus. And because of less stimulus, there's less learning, and therefore it's not burning as much. Okay, any questions on that? Does this occur from like a like exercise? I, like, I get more tired when I start doing like, like different exercises. Yeah. So there's Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. The question there was if you change or continue, and that's exactly what you're doing in the program. So that time frame you're looking anywhere between two to three weeks is your long phase. So if you get into the next like, program, the program should probably be two to three weeks on that minimum. That gives the body a chance to get to the moment. At that then you go anywhere up to 12 weeks. So if you're going longer than 12 weeks, you know, you're getting a sweat, you're burning. Getting, getting a lot of work on, but you're not actually doing a lot of calories. So that's why, in terms of training, you have different phases and change things up every every, every, every two or three months. Like right, the Goldilocks principle, you know, not enough, not too much, just right. That, that's kind of what you're looking for. So now we're going to go take that step further and we look at stress and arousal. So um, I forgot to mention earlier. It's not about stress avoidance, but stress management. So you can't avoid stress. It's how you put yourself in a situation to get the most out of it. So this graph is looking at stress in terms of the Goldilocks principle I mentioned. Not too much, not too little, just right. So if you come into a situation where it's too much too quickly, or it's too different, you're going to have a large, long phase, and you may not be able to sufficiently adapt to the stimulus. Obviously, if you're in a situation with no stress, the body just gets to on doing what it's doing. So in terms of that arousal, there's that optimal level. Now, uh, it's not on the slide, but there are only 45 stress patterns that any person can undergo. That's the reason why some people spend you know, stress junkies, they live on stress, they live on the deadlines. Some people like, can't handle stress, some people can handle some, but not a lot. So you get some people that can handle a lot, and then body says time out. So that again is very individualistic to go through. The key point of that is, is if you balance out the equation of exercise and recovery, you can actually improve your ability to become tolerant stress. If you have sick or you sickness, a life changing event, that as well can affect how your body moves forward in terms of stress management. Come to sleep, um slow information if you have a class. Uh, big big takeaway in terms of exercise portion is a lot of your anabolic hormones actually are secreted when you sleep. So if you don't sleep, your body's not going to fully recover metabolically. Plus, uh, uh, I forget which research it is, but that research where in six to eight hours sleep, the, body, the brain actually shrinks and the body actually washes the brain. So it helps the brain function. So the thing in terms of you know, too much, just right, that's what you end up having symptoms. 
So as I said earlier, in, uh, uh, exercise recovery, we want to get the most out of your health, wellness, and fitness. We focus on your stress, nutrition, and sleep. Okay. So moving on to nutrition, I know uh, this is something you can make some questions on. Uh, one of my favorite clients, I work with uh, clients, you know, put these in a row. You've got to eat for what you want to achieve. If you want to be healthy, you need to be healthy. If you want to get more make your body more efficient, you will need to eat to match that. If you don't feel the body, it's more likely you're going to break down. It's not going to work with you. It's going to work against you. So going through everything that you're covered, and this kind of going to pass, and then we're going to macros. So protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So proteins compared to fats and carbohydrates, what, what, what's the primary difference? Obviously, you've got the main functions there, builds, uh, lasting energy, source of energy. So, so what can you tell? What's the difference between your fats and carbs versus your protein? Well, protein is just like a the building blocks of the muscles, and uh, the carbs are like the like energy source, so it's like a unit, like energy source. Good. And that basic fat is the one. Yeah. So that's the primary breakdown and difference between macronutrients. Is the protein has got nothing to do with energy versus the fats and carbohydrates do. Um, consequently, uh, fats and carbs have an effect on your dopamine and hormones versus the protein and fat. Think of when you eat, you have a big plate uh, of protein, say chicken. Is that easy to eat? Or does it feel like more like hard work? You feel better afterwards or feel neutral. A lot of what you eat is in fats and carbs because that affects your dopamine, that's why we have a bad mood and stress. Those are what you reach for because they have that positive effect on your mood afterwards. Now, the big thing is we haven't got that up there, is in terms of protein, fats, and carbs. Has anyone got an idea what the calorie breakdown is per gram? Because there is a difference. Okay, so everyone see if I'm right. Okay, so your protein is basically four calories per gram. The fat is nine calories. And then the carbohydrates is four calories. There's something as we go on to the next couple of slides, and we'll work through a practical example of why that's important. So, the takeaway here it's not just necessarily I need to eat more protein, I need to actually look at the term for my daily goal, whether I want to achieve my gut weight, or I want to lose weight, or I want to retain weight. That's going to change how you break down in terms of uh, protein, fat, and carbs, and then what you actually need to work on. So, I've been through. Okay, total daily expenditures are worth it. So, total daily expenditures are calories you burn throughout the day and broken up into your base metabolic rates, your uh, expenditure of food, as well as movement. So, you can see in terms of your calorie burn, what is actually the most important thing to determine how many calories you burn a day? Well, what's the biggest component to that uh, breakdown? Basement mm -hmm. by breakdown. And what's what's the basic metabolic rate? When it does one plus. Yes, it's just like a, like just where you normally um, break down break down your fat, your energy, just yeah. your daily like activities. Yeah, so exactly that. So BMR is pretty much the calories you burn doing nothing. So it's broken down into what your organs, what your muscles, and what your tissues actually burn doing nothing. So when we look at that further. Your BMR can broken down into the different organs and the tissues. So again, you see all the organs that are actually active in their body processes, like the liver, your kidneys, your filters, your the brain, um, as well as the muscles. So even then, if you think about health conditions and wellness, you covered in class, is if you're healthier, you're younger, you burn more calories. As you get older, body gets older, gets less efficient, and what tends to happen? All those tissues burn fewer calories. So as you get older, it gets more and more important to be aware of the intake of food that you come in. Now on the right, this was a question that prepared, Professor we discussed is the why do you need to eat more proteins? And what we're looking for there is that's the uh, the metabolic effect of foods. So that graph in the X and Y 
you have your hours uh, following me on the X, on the Y, you have your percentage of calories. So what that means here is if you if you take 100 percent ingestion foods, if you take 10 grams of protein, that's 40 calories. So what it's saying is if you eat 40, 40 calories worth of protein, 30 percent of those calories will be used to burn to digest the food. Make sense? Same thing, carbohydrates, you're looking about 15 to 20 percent, and fats are probably about 7 to 10 percent. So, what's that saying is protein, it lasts longer in your system, costs more to actually digest, and what do you notice? The length of the curve it takes longer. You're looking at carbohydrates and lipids, generally, it lots uh, to the left of the, uh, of the curve, much quicker, much shorter, easier to digest. So, it's going to have a great effect, your body is going to burn fat, you're going to end up eating. So, um, kind of tying all that together, I'm just going to run through a practical example. So, when you go to gym, what generally you're going to have to do, you're going to want to do. You're going to either want to pick up weight, lose weight, turn up. That's all to do with the calorie breakdown in terms of the macronutrient combinations. I'm going to go back, back slide, two slides. So, you depending on what you're doing, you're going to basically lose weight. Protein fat carbohydrates can get the best one research is a 40 30 30 split. Well, I mean, 40 percent protein, 30 percent fat, 30 percent carbs. So, what to do there, if you want to gain weight, you're going to have to eat more carbohydrates because that's your energy source. So, you eat 50 percent carbs, 20 percent uh, fats, 30 percent protein, and then you have the special diets for the keto. Um, what else do we have? We have keto, your Atkins. They're not really sustainable long term, but there are specific measures as we go through. Um, questions? So, the long term effects like doing keto, uh, I've seen people do it for like long term. They, they can't. Long, long term, it's. It is extremely difficult. I don't want to have done it. It is more this process for blood and advances where your body uses protein. And fats to stabilize. So the point, like if you've been fasting with keto, you're taking away all the carbohydrates and then you're allowing it to protein fats to break that pressure. In terms of the calorie breakdown, uh, it's very difficult to keep fats only because it's going to have an effect on your lipids and cholesterol. So generally, a keto is more of a short term diet to actually then shut the body's. Focus away from carbohydrates. Um, as I have known people have done it, but it's, people lose a lot of weight initially because they're getting rid of the carbohydrates. But as soon as they go back to eating normal, the weight comes back up. So it is a diet that can be followed with its specific goal, but I personally would say it's not a not long term standard. And if what we're looking for is a, as a health professional, we want to try and make uh, behavior changes that are sustainable long term. But to me, there's no point that we go and you get great results for a couple of months. First, it goes out, then back to normal, and within three or four months, you're actually in the worst situation. Like, an um, example would be Fix Loser. I'm sure you will watch that. There's a ton of weight. I don't know if you're aware, most, most people lose that weight, put it back on again after the show. Because they go through the exercise, nutrition, but the behaviors in that situation are not the same. They don't learn. Okay, so the other thing we want to discuss is or determine is protein, which is very important for the body. Um, got the slide here, your protein encyclopedia. The three sources, your dairy, your meats, and plant based Normal proteins are equal. And that's kind of why I've gone through and got through the calorie breakdown. We're going to kind of run through that moment. So the uh, reason why is you think, okay, I'm eating protein. Uh, it's a cut of meat, uh, say ribs. The protein content might be 25, 20 25%. Technically, is that a protein source or the fat source? So the composition is 25% protein. What's the other 75%? So fat or calories? Fat, 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 fat or carbohydrates. Yeah. So Yes, we think I need the protein, all protein is the same. So just running through that. So let's see at the top there. So just run through. So low fat yogurt, how many calories? 52. Okay. 
How much protein? 10 grams. Okay. So the 10 grams, how many calories per gram? Uh, 10 a gram of um, calories is going to be four, four calories per gram. Yeah, so you're looking at 40, 40 calories from your protein. So if I go, you're 40 divided by 62. What's that? Oh, Max, how good? Okay. Now we'll take the worst of Pando at the bottom there we go to cheese. How many calories? Uh calories going two eighty. Okay. How many guys protein? Uh it's gonna be twenty six grams. Okay. Multiply that by four. Two hundred four. Two hundred four calories. So we've got one of four divided by two eighty. What's that? Thirty six. Thirty seven percent. Yeah. They see top to bottom. That says protein source. Which one's the better protein source? Um, it's gonna be gonna be the yogurt. Exactly. Just look at the difference here. You only got 20, 22 calories. We're gonna come to carbohydrates and fats. Here you've got what are we 104? You've got 176 calories that I'm counting. So if you were going to the gym, I want to get lean, lose weight, I want to gain weight. You've got to actually break down the macronutrients that you are taking in to what exactly the calories are. So you go and say, I'm going to eat protein. You have more cheese. How much protein are you going to get? 37%. So if I'm trying to hit 100 grams of protein, but only 37% of you go through cheese, yeah. how many calories are you going to take? In? Yeah, a lot of calories. If I do the same thing with I eat 100 grams of protein in terms of there, well, that's going to take 10 times the 620 calories of yogurt that will give me my 100 grams of protein. Yeah. If I'm doing here, as you said, it's 26, I'm going to multiply that by, by four. This is getting to what's it, 8, 16, 24, it's over 1,000 calories. Yeah. You can see where the problem comes in. Yeah. That you can think of eating healthy. But what are you doing to turn calories into that? It's way up higher, and then you wonder why you're not losing weight. So the way to look at it is, if you eat the same amount as you burn, what's going to happen to your weight? So, nothing. Just that same. If my weight is going up, am I eating more or burning more? Eating more. If I'm losing weight, I'm burning more than I need. That's the simple equation. So. In terms of your goals, if you wonder why well, I'm eating a lot of protein, I'm this, I'm not going, I'm going, that's where this concentration becomes important. That you look at everything, it's like, okay, yeah, it could be meat, but if I'm having a cut of meat uh, that's 30% protein, or I'm having a 95% lean mince, that's, that's it, 95% protein, big difference in calories, you have to get the same protein from it. So that's why. It's important in terms of understanding the, the, the calorie burning effect of the different macronutrients, as well as then the calorie concept or the, the, the protein concentration. So we get, I can work with a lot of people that come in, I'm eating healthy, why am I not getting my goal? Because they don't understand it's a simple arithmetic. My only disclaimer to that equation is if you have a health concern or a medication, that does change things a bit, but that, that's another, another, another conversation as we go through. Um, Easy example. So it's one of the certifications I've got that does a really nice slide. It's actually really good if you're looking for nutrition uh, advice. I've got lots of really good articles. Precision Nutrition is online. Um, really, really good. I recommend you looking at that. At the top there, it's got their breakdown. So you're looking at about 30% uh, protein, 40% carb, 30% fat. That's typically what you pledge to look like. You're looking at about um, two servings of protein. Probably a couple servings of vegetables, uh, the avocado, maybe two servings of fats, and then the apples and fruits as carbohydrates. And let's low here, we've got a low protein meal, 
Does that look fairly familiar? You can see 29% protein, 53% carb, 38% fat. And then on the bottom right here, this is kind of typically what the American diet is. So you have 17% protein, 46% carb, 30% fat. Now, if I was to do the protein or pro the, the calorie, Breakdown of that. That meal is probably looking at you're looking at probably about right here. Well, it would take a guess how many calories you can get in those countries. Yeah, right on to this. We don't know what the weight is, but I'm just saying, looking at that plate, how many calories would you say probably in that meal? Let's say 400. This, this meal, probably going to find that's going to probably be about 300 calories because everything's clean. So the, the, the nutrient intake is going to be high, the, the, the protein concentration is going to be high. So it looks like a lot of food, a lot of calories. But because it's calorie, it's nutrient dense, not calorie dense. So this is going to have all your micronutrients, your macronutrients in it, without the excess calories. Meal options at the bottom, um, okay, what's the soda? That's probably about three, four hundred calories. Um, Fifty club sandwich. What's that looks like it's probably it's going to be like five six hundred calories by itself. So that meal right over here probably going to be about seven or six hundred to thousands, and this one over here is probably going to be fifteen hundred to two thousand calories. Now the reason why I'm saying it's that much, if you go quickly check the menu, look at the calories on the menu. When you go out, anyone? Okay. On legislation, all those calorie numbers only have to be within twenty five percent. Of what it actually is. If it says a thousand, it's a people like family coffee. That doesn't take into account the way it's prepared. If you cook it in oil, to add all the extras, that's why it tastes good. If it says a thousand calories, you're probably going to take in 1500 to 2000. So that's why one of the big parts of health and wellness is preparing meals at home. Those are the ingredients that you actually bring into the meals. You can have a whole meal, but how it's prepped will completely change what you go through. Questions? I don't want to eat too many of you on the spot because just you want to understand why maybe not where you want to be and how do you actually do this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pH, um, big big one myself with the people. Uh, I worked at the club one time for privacy, had a basketball court, uh, went to college, played basketball, put healthy 10 years, they've been working without a promotion, they were in the gym, they come back to get basketball, they still think they're in college and at least a couple times per month, myself and the other staff would be carrying people out of ruptured ACLs and things. So, what I put that in is exactly that. You may have done this in the past. You may have been able to do something in the past. What have you done in the recent history? So, that's where the lifting age comes in. And the reason why this is important is I'm sure most of you go online, look in terms of health and fitness, training programs, the articles. You have your professionals, it's their program. Now that's, that's a little bit of an issue if you're not actually lifting, if you're not actually exercising. That's why your body is not in the same situation as that professional. That is maybe why you started and you see no results. So your lifting age is determining what you're currently doing and designing and trying to start at that point to lead body to what we said earlier with the general adaptation syndrome. You see the symbols that the body recognizes the different that brings about a change in body improves. If I suddenly tell you go, you know, let's go right outside for three hours, how are you going to feel? Yeah, to do it, but then tomorrow the day after, you're probably done and dusted. But if we do, okay, today we're going to do 20 minutes. We have a couple of weeks, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, well, give it, give it five or six months, hey, you have to do three hours, no problem. So that's kind of where we look to attempt to look at. Just think of what you're currently doing, where you want to go, and that's where working with the professional, understanding the variables that come through, how do we design a program to go in. Okay, probably the most important thing uh, when we look at the health and fitness is uh, SMART goals. The SMART, Specific Medical Tangle and Effect Timing. Uh, what you're basically looking there is you have coming up with what, what's your motivation, why you're doing and what's your time frame. So think of when you, if, you're, if you're going to your own health and fitness program. Why, why would you want to start a program? 
the business moves. Yeah, I call it person. Yeah, it's exactly it's a fitness goal. What else? It's not a right to run. Just think of it as like, why would you go to the gym? And it's moving. You lose weight. Exactly. So you decrease weight. What else? Um, we happen to want to look better. Sure. Okay, so basically, body comp, so let's say percent body fat. Recover from an injury. Yeah, and increase weight. And then rehab. Exactly. So those are obviously there's different breakdowns. Those are more typical of why you come in. Looking at this, the, 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 the smart, the specific measure of training and realistic, are those smart goals? So think of are, are these specific? I mean, yeah, they're specific to being like. Well, let's say subjectively or objectively. So subjectively, you have to want to lose weight, but is, is there a set amount? Do you have a specific goal that you want to achieve? I mean, it's in the general goal, it's not specific. Yeah, so exactly that. So how do we make these into goals you can break down into a plan? Um, you can say, well, you can set this a certain goal, like lose 50 pounds by so-and-so date, that next, yeah. or swim better, like uh, increase it by like, increase my speed by by a minute or two by a certain day. You can say that. That's perfect. So kind of set yourself a goal. Just think of anything you've done in the past. If this, if, if I want to do this, if there's a positive outcome and reward at the end, you have greater or lesser motivation to do it. Greater motivation because you're getting a reward out of it. You're getting some sort of uh, positive uh, feedback at the end. So that's where, in terms of your health and fitness journey, you want to be specific and you want to be measurable. So if you said fitness goal, okay, I'm going to be swimming. Well, okay, it can be I want to I want to swim this distance in this amount of time. Or I want to be able to swim for this amount of time. The key then, and we'll kind of go through the weight loss as well as the body fat percentage, is also setting a time frame. Because generally we are all procrastinators, you know, you need things as long as like as possible. If you have no deadline, what's your motivation to actually then achieve it? Uh, not very much. Not very much. It's it's in the distance. It's not in the now. Exactly, and then you kind of keep going, keep staying in the distance, mm -hmm. and you don't get closer to the goals. So what happens to motivation? It goes down. It goes down, and then as I said, that's where most people by the first of February have given up already. So come through. So typically, looking at your goals, obviously, uh, I think you went through your different types of training. Um, in terms of your fitness goal, uh, like if you want to do any aerobic work, that takes about three months of adaptation. The anaerobic system takes two or three days, or two or three, three, two or three weeks, big pardon. So depending on what you're doing, you're looking anywhere there from say three weeks to a couple of months to get to the improvement in fitness goal. Um, your weight, technically, uh, what's a safe weight loss per week? Um, like what do you mean? Yeah. So like half a pound to a pound. So half a pound to a pound is, is uh, it's typical that you can, if it's a goal, one to two pounds per week. What would be considered dangerous? Do you think about this? I mean, again, it depends on what situation you're in. If you're in a medical situation, you're under medical supervision, you could probably do a bunch of things like crazy. If, um, if your goal is just to lose weight, yeah. uh, I think uh, it's there. I, I've gained and lost 20 pounds a week just by not being able to eat. Depends what you eat, how you eat. So, but it's, it, within a week, it's like I didn't maintain it. So, it depends on what your goal is. You just want to lose as much weight as you can. You can lose crazy weight and you keep it off. That's the question related to goals. Now, how do we get to doing that? So what I said earlier, if you eat the same as you burn, you're going to basically have a head to zero. If you want to lose weight, what do you need to do? Increase activity and then uh, increase like calorie intake. Increase like protein. So that's that's pretty much what you do. The options you have are you eat less, exercise more, or combination of them. But perfect, perfect example. Now, how do we figure out what the half and two pounds are? How many calories do you think is in a pound of fat? Yeah. So one pound of fat in your body, so think of your fat cell, it's a sort of vessel. 
because one pound of fat is the equivalent of 3,500 calories that you have to liberate if you want to lose it. So if I take 3,500 calories divided by seven, how many is that per day? That's 5,500. The bottom line is if you want to lose a pound a week, you can be having a deficit of 500 calories a day. So we kind of went through all the previous calculations. You have your total daily energy expenditure. That gives how many calories you burn at the end of the day. You subtract 500. That's your calorie target, and you break it down into macronutrients. And that's pretty much how, how you can look at what you eat to break it down further. So, good. so anyone that wants to come in, so if we come back here, what was the goal? You want to lose 30 pounds. How long is that going to take? Between 60 and 15 weeks. Depends on how, how aggressive you want to be. The general rule of thumb is the more aggressive you are, the less likely you are to be able to maintain it. Why? And that's because the behaviors have to be more extreme. And because it's more extreme, what are the, what are the opportunities, what are the chances you'll actually be able to maintain it? So for those of you that have health and fitness goals, sustainable behaviors are the most important thing. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be the textbook of what you can maintain that leads you the path to which goals. And this? Okay, so uh, let's see. Wait, that's, that's pretty much your weight loss. Uh, in terms of your body fat percentage, if someone wants to come in, I want to look better. Um, again, I want to look better. Is that, is that, is that a smart goal? Yeah, that's, that's a goal. I mean, yeah, like you have a set parameter like you want to have. I think you have to get them to sure, man. I think you got to get between 10 and 12 percent. Well, that's actually what I'm going. So yeah. that's what I'm going to cover. So exactly. So if I just want to look better, what does it look like to you? Yeah. Um, when I work with someone they don't know, it'll be like, okay, exactly that. You want abs, don't you want abs? Uh, easy one, you're on social media, everyone follows someone, and then they help professional. What do they look like? So you get a reference point. So, so going to that, so if you've got male or female, you have the essential body fat. Does anyone know what that is? That's the fat to insulate you. Basically, yeah, exactly. that's, your, that's your bare minimum that you need to survive. So if you've got male, it's about 3%. Ladies, we're looking at what was it, 12, 12%. Obviously, there are gender differences here. So as we come through. So six pack. Give you a one six pack. Okay. Body fat percentage, males, you're looking at about 6% or less. Ladies, you're looking at about 15%. Okay. The four pack. Okay, the next one, so you know, six, four, two. Four pack, you're looking here, this you're probably looking at uh, less than 12%. Here, you're looking at less than 18%. The two pack, for males, you're looking at about 15%. Ladies, think about 20%. Now, the benefit here is once you get to like the 15 or 20% mark, that's kind of where you flip. <coughs> the thing that we go to gym is it easy. No. We, if you're in terms of senior goals, it's hard work. You don't get to see much from the start. Once you get south of these numbers, you'll find that's when it gets easier because that's when the body starts working. For you, not against you. So there's a lot of times when working with clients is understanding that these marks and these thresholds, where it's, it's a lot of hard work until you get to the point. But once you're beyond that point, that's when it gets easier. Look at a lot of professional athletes. You see what they do, you see what they eat, and it probably doesn't make sense because they're at this bottom end where the rules they play by are different. So starting off with it's tough. Now on the other side. If I go male about 25, ladies about 30, that's where your health is coming. So from a health, you've got your performance, fitness goals, and how you're looking and performing. And the other side of the equation, you then have your health. And the key then is, again, on age and goals, where are you sitting? So ladies, you're going to want to be looking at about 20, 25%, guys, about 15 to 20. That's kind of where you're looking at your acceptable. Um, I know it does, having worked here, Australia, South Africa, what's ideal and what is acceptable it does change because of the population. Like when I was in college back in South Africa, the guys who told me had to be around single figures. That was the expectation for us to, for us to be eligible. 
So again, it depends where you're at and then what you're actually doing. Uh, any, any questions for that? Um, yeah. It's a little more complicated. Yeah. That's why it's, think of it, if, if you sit down and you do more of these calculations, it's less random and you're controlling more of the variables. So what are your chances of success going to be? Higher or lower? Higher. Because the more you understand the variables that you're playing with, you can change one variable, see what the reaction is. Change another variable, see what the reaction is. And as I said right at the beginning, specificity, individual specificity, your body is each of you different, which variable is going to give you the most bang for the buck. But that comes down, long story short, that's the purpose of smart goals. Where you're at, you do an assessment, where you want to be, how to put the plan together. Gives you a time frame, gives you a, a realistic expectation as to if you want to lose a certain amount of weight, get down to a certain body fat, this is what you're going to have to do. And if I said to you, it's like, you want to get six pack, you go, yes, great. Okay, well, you have to lose 20% body fat. That's going to take you six to 12 months. Does that work for you? Yes or no? Okay, yes. Okay, this is what you need to do. No, why it doesn't. And you can actually then delve into psychology and motivation if you went back to the scientific beginning to get you to your goal. So it's less random, less luck, and it's actually very, very, very much under control. Now, this is pretty much all sitting down, uh, we've gone through the paperwork, we interviewed the person. Now we actually get to doing some sort of assessments. So, in this, if you're the person uh, doing it, it's kind of looking at what you can currently do, giving you a baseline. So, you know where you want to be, where you start, these are your assessments. You have your health, your health assessments and you have your fitness assessments. Your health assessments are pretty much looking at your internal functioning. Um, that can be a blood pressure. I specifically put that there because about six or seven years ago, it changed. It just used to be you know, 120 over 80 is great, but the systolic and the diastolic, the measures have been changed recently in terms of being elevated. Even if you're a 120 over 80, it, it can be, it can be uh, variable. Other things you can do, cholesterol, uh, diabetes, blood sugar, you're looking at these things that affect organs and your body function. As I said earlier, your, your basal metabolic rates will affect so everything, how your body metabolizes, how your body utilizes energy to change them and help them. So components of fitness, as I said, endurance, flexibility, cardiovascular body composition, muscular strength. It depends why you're going to do it. Or why, why you're exercising. Is it a sports performance goal? Is it a health and fitness goal? Um, I said a client, clients told me, I can't do something. I go, I can't do the vocabulary, it's what you currently can't do. And you fix that with hard work. The one comes off the nine, two comes off the one. Keep working at it, and we'll get it up. So when someone comes in stark, we've got to test all the variables, see where you're strong, see where you're weak. But that tells me what you do, what you can do, what we actually need to work on. General principle change, now we're going more on to the We've got a person that's come in, you know what they want to achieve, you know what they can do. How do we manipulate the variables of actually training? And this is looking at individuality. I've spoken about number times. Each person is different, lifestyle behavior is different, motivation is different. So you can't treat everyone all the same. Uh, if you happen to be on a team, that's a little different, but that's a homogeneous population. So you're working with a bunch of individuals, that plan is specific to you. Um, so we're going to talk. I had a client, someone I worked with in the gym at Arnold Schwarzenegger's program. We worked really hard for two months. And she came in and said, I've been working hard and got the results. And my crazy my answer to that was, you know, definitely, you know, great work you're putting in, but you don't have Arnold Schwarzenegger's genetics, you definitely don't have his tests. So understand that what works for someone may or may not work for you is understanding your body and listening to your body. The flip side of that is if you go to most interviews with your health and fitness competitors, you get to the older competitors at 35, 40, the one thing most of them say was, well, I wish I did this to my body and my friends. If you wouldn't have made it, many mistakes. That's my 50 cents would be if you get your health and fitness journey, figure out what works best for you. That has to do the textbook answer, but if it feels good and seeing the results, keep doing that. We then also have specificity. Um, you know, if you want to be a better runner, 
go and buy for two or three hours a week is not going to help your brain. It might help your heart and your lungs, but it's not the same counts. So if you want to get better at something specifically, you're going to need to practice that. If you want to bench more, you're going to have to bench more in your, in your program. Uh, reversibility, use or lose, um, you'll find there, if you don't train it, because the body, think of it, the general adaptation syndrome, you apply the stress and adapt it to it. If I don't do anything, I remove the stressor, so the body retrains. Um, out of interest, um, metabolic conditioning or deconditioning starts about three to four days after exercise. So if you stop to take three or four days off, you'll find your anaerobic fitness will decrease. Your strength, however, will last for 30 days, from the full month before it starts decreasing. So that's why in terms of your training, the planning of your programs, um, taking time off, you manipulate that variable to get the most out of the body. You then also have progressive overload. That's where uh, you're changing the variables to make the body work harder. In terms of weight, most people get focused on, oh, I need to put more weight to the bar. That's the easy way of doing it. Um, you know, I know about the whole cycling muscle thing. It's like uh, for cardio, should like because it's uh, like uh, the endurance last three days. So you do, should you do like a like a like a cardio day every three days to build that well, muscle? Well, or is well, it like every day? That's where you, you've got to be careful. Yeah. Because cardiovascular and sprint are complete opposites. Yeah. Think of a hundred meter sprinter and a distance runner marathon. Yeah. So if you want to go to the gym and want to pick up muscle, and you want to do cardio. By weight of stimulus, the body is not going to pick up the muscle mass. There are ways you can do conditioning where you're not spending hours doing cardio that then affects your muscles. Right. It's more to do with, uh, and this is a little more, we're not going to cover some of the lecture, but how you would, uh, I think it's a super conversation like principles, but how you control the weight and the bumps that will dictate what your goals are. Right. That's where the fun stuff of actually designing program comes in because. You know, someone that I want to pick up weight, but I want to get in at the same time. You can do that without them saying, let's do hours and hours of cutting. It's just more time for someone to get you to get to the goals. Good. Okay, yeah, so I uh, said progressive overload, pick up the weight. Um, but then uh, the easier ones, we've got the rest interval, so the words you can set and short the rest. It's going to make you more tired, so what's it going to do to stress? It? It's going to increase the stress. Uh, you can add reps. Every week you come in, I pick the same weight, I'm going to add one or two reps. Each week I'm adding something. So I'm sure most of you um, don't know what kettlebells are in the gym. Okay. So I didn't notice that kettlebell go up to 10 pound increments. That's actually by design because you earn the right to the it. So a kettlebell program, I think most gyms and most magazines, it's always a certain amount of reps, certain weight, drop the reps, increase the weight. Right. That's what you see. But you can't do that set of kettlebells because it's 10 pound increments. So what you could do would be Week one would be I go in, I'm going to do three sets of 10 at 60 seconds rest. I play around with the variables, end of 12 weeks, I'm doing six sets of 20 at 30 seconds rest. You can see what I've done. I've increased the volume with less rest. So what does it mean? My body's got more efficient. So now I'm ready to go after the kettlebell, what do I do? If I hit on the kettlebell, I go back to three sets of 10 at one minute. Because I can't change the weight. So everyone gets hung up on the overload being the weight, but if you're going intensity wise or this would be that's going to hit you. Much better, that much that's get much higher. So. so that's why it depends on training with someone and training by yourself. With these variables you play around with that there's do more continuously don't just get stuck in the same same thing over and over again. Uh, but hard workout that's intensity and the periodization at the end kind of ties with your question is just how do you cycle things? Yeah. And that's actually going on to my next slide. And again, this is the fun stuff in training uh, and, and working with summer. Um, in terms of the season, you have off season, pre season, in season. This is the acute variable that's playing. So the general adaptation syndrome is more of your chronic every day, month and month. The supercompensation is more about what is your individual workout due to you on the day. So the variables you have, you obviously have your time and performance, your fitness baseline, which is your homeostasis. So if I want to get fitter, what should happen to that baseline? It should increase it. Should increase it. So that's kind of what we've got on the side there where it says a positive. Let's see how the, the line's going up. So I'm looking at performance. If the line's going up, what's happening? My fitness is going, my fitness is getting better, I'm getting stronger. You then have the bottom there, no conversation. So what's that saying? 
basically I come back, I put the server saying the same, and then you have the negative, it's basically the same, I put the server stop it. Now the variables to get that we have the time recovery, so negative lifting session. If you're more of a, a novice intermediate, it's going to take you to two or three days. So this cycle to this point to have a conversation for a normal person about two three days. So if I'm saying it takes me two to three days to cover from session a week, how many how many sessions a week should we do? Two three days recovery? Yeah. So you're looking at two to three sessions per week is your answer. An athlete will do more, but if a normal person you're lifting three times a week. Both. You then have how hard you work will be your fatigue. If it's a hard you work, what's going to happen to your fatigue? Fatigue is going to be greater. So, what's going to happen to recovery back? A little longer. Exactly. So, as you get quicker, your body gets more efficient. That time frame decreases. If you're not eating right, sleeping right, looking after yourself, that recovery process is going to take longer. It depends where you pick your next workout. Will depend whether you're going to go up, down, or set second. For example, I do my next cycle and I catch it right at this point of the conversation. Yeah. Where's my fatigue going to be in the next cycle? Down here, where's my next recovery? Up and down. So you can see how it's working its way up to improve over time. Yeah. And like I said, that can be looking at athletes in terms of the year. That's where you look at competitions. Uh, um, football's the easiest. Think of teams the first month of the season that they can get at the end of the season, they're cleaning up clubs. We've got teams that come out of the gate. First month, no concussion. Are they performing at the same level at the end of the season? They're pretty much losing it. All depends on where they're at in terms of that sort of conversation. So that kind of ties into what your question was earlier. It's how do you manipulate this in yeah. terms of your week? Yeah, you can do it. It's easy to do. So, so someone like, uh, if I was working with an athlete, my typical breakdown would be, uh, first thing, seven days a week, or any, any, any person would be, my first thing is to schedule a day off. So at least one day a week off doing that. Why? Because when you exercise, when you do the body breaking down. So I need one day because that's when I'm actually going to recover. So Monday through Friday, Monday through Sunday, I might say Sunday to day off. How many days you want to look? Let's, let's look three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, follow to the conversation cycle with those the days that we look. Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Okay, we can do some mobility works and like cardio. But what are we going to be careful of? What about the fatigue? The fatigue. Because if you have a hard sessions in a row daily, this is going to head down. So if you maybe go like a hard day on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you could do a light day, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and day off, over time this increases. So personally, when I work with someone, I look at the issue of cardio, that's an athlete, I use cardio to recover. To help the body with circulation, don't go out there and smash it. Yeah. Um, but it's good advice you lift every day. But you, you can lift every day, but that's fairly advanced. Okay. Because why? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, if, again, if you're more, more uh, advanced, your body responds quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you're lifting every day, it's going to be a much more simple program because you're probably doing more body parts mm -hmm. only. So, think of it as the whole body stress versus isolated stress. Yeah. Um, I do say body part splits is a little more advanced for looking at that, that should be easier. But think what's the commitment needed? If you're doing body parts yes. and you, no, you're, not you're, you're not committed, you miss a day, it's two weeks before you get around to train the body part. So, someone that's a little more novice, I generally would do whole body workouts because if you miss one, you still get in the whole body as you think. Right. Any, any questions on that? Uh, yeah, you know, I would ask, how, how do you know when you're like feeling like when you're in that fatigue area? It's like when you're just feeling lethargic the next day. Like, I've been there where I feel like I trained myself too much. Yeah, so, through conversation, the end point is over training. So, that's where everything goes south. The reason is set before that term is overreaching. So, that's why you'll find the long face, you're tired, you're sore, your body's fine, you get more energy, you get fitter, the weights improve. When you tend to overreach, that's when the motivation will decrease, your appetite might decrease, your sleep may be affected. And generally, you just find you get more in general. Mm -hmm. That's generally around the time you're overreached, take a week off. Because what's going to happen that week? You're going to just recover. You're going to recover, and yes, your body's going to decondition a little bit. But when you get back to training, you're back to your baseline within a week or two, and you're not going to be dragging. Yeah. 
So then you make a progress in the next six weeks. Does everyone understand that? Because everyone thinks is like exercise breaks the body down, if the body's not progressing, it's probably because it's too tired to actually do it. Taking some time off the work to recovery will actually get you longer term loss. I think I said right in the beginning, exercise equals recovery. If you're not going anywhere, more than likely long term your exercise is exceeding your recovery, and that's why your body's not good. And that's the harder you work, the worse you get. Oh no, I was thinking about like all those protein shake, all those supplements, like like helping you recover faster. Like are they just pseudoscience or they just well they, they, I think the I did want to the question. Like supplementation. The, the the supplementation is in the name. Yeah. Is if your diet is terrible, yeah, supplements not gonna help you. Oh, okay. Um you need to be have a good base in terms of your sleep, your nutrition, and then the supplements help you get that little extra. Um depends what you take. Uh and there's actually I forget about the name, but there is a uh, a government organization that tracks reports against supplement companies. Yeah. Just because it says it's in there doesn't necessarily mean it is in there. It's contaminated. Um, there was an issue uh, a few months back where a lot of supplement companies were putting they call it hollow amino acids into proteins, shakes, yeah. to fill out the amino acid profile, but your body can't use that. So it's just like basically almost like that's how it's going on. Yeah, you, you're paying, you're paying for nothing. And a lot, of, a lot of the supplements you get in the store are a little more uh, sort of pseudoscience. Has anyone heard of the SIBO effect? So, so it's kind of like a snake oil sort of thing. Exactly. And that's, that's why the thing you need is hard work, a plan, and if you eat and sleep right. If you do that, you will get results. The supplements may help you, like, like the top end for the, the, the athletes, for us, two or three percent is not going to do much. But if you're an Olympic level athlete for 100 meters and you can improve your performance by two or three percent, that's a big difference in the top end. Generally, supplementation is good if it fills in a gap, if you don't want to rely on supplements. The typical example would be, um, like, like say, increase your protein intake. If you're eating what you can and you're still short, then yes, a protein shake is going to help you. Why? Give you more protein, give you more calories. But if you're eating junk food and you take a protein shake and they get results, you don't, that's not going to work. Because what's your most of your nutrition? Yeah, it's like something your body can use. If, like, most people will just like with regular nutrition help you recover. You really don't need these. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's so that's that's where everyone kind of thinks I need the supplement to do the work for me. A lot of it again, physiology. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of creatine. Yeah. There is such a thing as a creatine non response. If I said right at the beginning of individuality, people can take different things, but different results. The big key is, as I said, hard work, plan, and good based nutrition. If you do that, the stimulus you allowing your body to recover and you work with your health and your fitness will go. The principles, as we spoke about in class, uh, frequency, intensity, time, height, generally your, vol your volume, uh, this will be on the next slide. Volume in terms of lifting is the reps times the sets times the weight. So we spoke about it earlier. Frequency, if I work out harder, is my frequency going to be higher or low? It's going to be less because there's more fatigue. Intensity, the harder I work, the less I do. So in terms of lifting, if the weight is higher, do I do more or less? Higher or less. So there is a number. So I'm sure most of you read magazines that talk about 100% or one rep max. The very advanced metric that means weight that you can lift once with the top form, not bad form, perfect form. When you are actually training, you can use that as a, as a model. So 100% is one, you just double your number of reps, subtract it from 100, and that's your percentage. So if I want to do 10 reps, you should be working about 80% your max. It's a theoretical, so it's about right, but you need to be working the right, the right way for my the right amount of reps to actually get the goal. Because if the stress isn't high enough, what's going to happen? It's uh, like it's not going to do anything. You got to like way more. Exactly the same thing. That's why there's, there's no easy way. I ask so my clients, it's you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. My job is to make you uncomfortable. But if you do it the right way, your body improves. Mm -hmm. well, like I really don't have any workout buddies. Like mm -hmm. when I do that, 
it's just uh, like I, I'm at that point where I'm just lifting dangerous weights. Yep. Like so, so I just keep doing like the, the high rep because I'm like hitting like 300 at this point, but like I don't I don't want to like go past that just by myself. <laughs> yeah, but that, that that's also the safety. Yeah, you said. But if you then cut your reps down, yes. that's will allow you to then increase your weight by five to ten nanograms. So it's like I, I would climb 12, 10, 7, 5, 3. Yeah. If I do 12 reps and increase the weight, if I'm going to go 5, 10 pounds heavier, I'm not going to go from 12 reps down to constantly now to do one. Yeah. If I have to work, I'm going to do three or four, yeah. but now you've gone heavier, you've got a, a baseline, what do you next time? I did four, I'm going to do five. Five, I'm going to do six to get back up to 12. Oh. So there's a way, yes, you are lifting heavier, which is great, but you want to keep on improving your stimulus. Oh, because okay. adding reps, that's muscular endurance and muscular strength. Right. So that's a different stimulus. So a nice way would be to get, add 10 pounds to lift, drop the number of reps, you get time to make five. Right. And then you know you can do five next week, I'm going to do six. Right. Seven, you keep adding, when you get back to 12, increase the weight, drop the reps back down. That's what I do, so I don't train with, uh, I don't have a training partner either. So it's kind of yeah, safety on it's, it's, it's a little dangerous. There's not many people that can add up with say. Um, and just your program design girl also said it's going more into the watch. It said if you're a kinesiology major or train, train someone, this is kind of what we're looking at. These are the acute variables within the session. Um, these analysis will cover that exercise selection. That's pretty much what exercise you want to do. Big three in the gym, squat, deadlift, standing, lift, press. Why? Whole body exercise. Uh, if you're sitting on the bench doing bicep curls, if basically, your body's not worth it's just your arms. How many calories are going to burn? Not a lot. So, exercise selection determines how many muscles are active throughout the session. That can determine a, how hard the workout is, also how many calories you burn. Train frequency, as I said, covered previously, just a number of times per week. Uh, exercise order um, is just to do with the big muscle groups first, smaller muscle groups second. I use that as a general rule. I just find sometimes if someone has an imbalance, so uh, pull-ups, for example, most people do bicep pull-ups with the pull-ups so they need to back. So we're trying to bite into the forward pull-ups. It makes it a lot harder, but it's the last get to do the work. Um, training loaded reps, uh, coming down to set safety, training partner, goals, the thing experience, all that has an effect. Generally, if you want to get a whole volume effect from lifting, you can lift about 85%. So you're looking seven reps or less at the right intensity to get that benefit. Volume, that's just your reps times your sets times your weight. So you multiply that out. As you get heavier, your product should get lower. If you're doing more with heavier weight, you're setting yourself up for risk of overtraining and injury as you go through. And then at the end, it's just your rest periods. Um, shorter your rest period, the less recovered you are. The thing is, if I'm going to short rest periods, what's going to happen in 10 seconds from the Really low. So that might be going to 30 second rest interval, you might be lifting maybe 65% of the maximum 12, 15 reps. If I'm going to go one rep max or two to three reps, I'm probably resting three to five minutes between sets. Because just do it to substrate utilization and recovery. Any, any, any questions on that? Uh, for like training, oh, for like resting, it's just like, like what, like how many minutes, two, three? It depends on the intensity. Oh, okay. So like, Super heavy, super heavy, it's three. probably two to three months. Because you are, uh, I can't remember the exact time that you have with two of the lactic acid, acid half life. Yeah. So I think it's about three minutes or 50% recovery. The next three minutes, there'll be 50% of what's left, and then it continues oh. as, as you go through. So if you're you know, trying to do one RM and a one minute rest interval, you might get one rep up, and that's it. The next rep, your body's going to serve it to you. So it's kind of like sprinting, and like you feel like the tightness of the muscle, and then you take a little rest and feel better. Exactly. So that's kind of where those variables interact. Is how much weight, how often, and at what intensity to recover. Um, and then pretty much what exercises you do. The seven movement patterns, got to squat, lunge, push, pull, bend, which is your hinge, and your core anti anti-rotation moves. So in terms of the exercises, as long as you have one of each in a workout, you're good. So if you do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you pick one squat variation, one lunge variation, one push, one pull, one hinge, one core exercise. You repeat that for four to six weeks, changing your rep sets, weights as you go along. You'll get some. That's it. Nothing fancy. 
It is covering every body, every muscle, every body part. You're doing it over a number of weeks, get the body used to it, and you get better. If you're an athlete, a little bit different, but for a normal person, a program with those seven variables at a time with the appropriate stimulus will get you those results. And then this is something just right in here uh, in terms of feedback and uncovering areas that can improve. It's great to go to the gym, it's great to put the effort in, but you do actually have to check if you're going in there. And a lot of people, this is where your motivation falls down because you go in, you let's say, put that time and effort, and nothing's happening. So this comes down to our plan, our deadlines, our goals is we want to actually see if you are improving. Because if not, there's nothing wrong with that, but that means something missing. And that's all you do is sit back, speak to people, self evaluate, look at what you are doing, what you're not doing, and what do I need to change. Because to me, there's nothing more frustrating. You put an effort in, you make, you make the time, you put an effort in, nothing's happening. And this is where it might be a small thing, like I'll use one of my clients as an example, he wanted to lose weight. It was kind of, I was doing this, but I got him to write everything down. And the only thing he was doing wrong was how he was prepping his food. And what he was doing was using olive oil. So oil is one of the most dense calorie uh, liquids that you can have. So a teaspoon of olive oil, so I think a tablespoon of olive oil is about 500, 150 calories. So if you're preparing two or three meals and using that much olive oil per day, is adding about five, 600 calories to your diet. If you want to lose weight, what do we say the calorie deficit needs to be? Um, so if he's adding 600 calories to the way to prep his food, what he would have to weigh? He would lose the weight. It's going up very slowly because he was 100 to 200 calorie excess. So this is probably in terms of once you get into your program, the most health of this program for hearing. This is the most important. It's set, set time frames for you to actually see if you're improving, retest yourself. Get your body comp done, the, the, the scale, it's telling you a story. Not that you do whatever you do is right or wrong, it's whether it's working for you or not. And from a, from a professional point of view, it's one of the most frustrating things we see people go into the gym, you know, have, have the goals, have the motivation, and not see any changes. And this is just a cycle instead. Assess your tools, compare, get information, reassess, see where you're going, and make changes. Because as I think we spoke earlier, if you want to lose 50 pounds, that's a lot of weight. So you want to break that down. You want to see, are we going per week? Are we going there for a couple of weeks? Are we dropping the weight? Is the body fat going down? Is the performance going up? Because if you keep checking those boxes for long enough, what's going to happen? You'll actually get to want to be and be able to stay there because you've done it in a good, smart way with good behaviors. Thoughts? Scared anyone? 